Welcome back to AP World Simplified, and today we're going to be discussing the Mongol Empire that ruled from about 1206 to 1368 CE, spanning a massive land empire that went from Central Europe to the Middle East, Persia, and all the way as far east as Korea. Now, the Mongol Empire officially began in Central Asia in 1206, when a council of Mongol leaders elected as their leader Genghis or Chinggis Khan. Chinggis Khan would take this group of Central Asian pastoralists and carve out the largest single continuous land empire in world history, second only in surface or land area to the broken up British Empire that spread across all uh, habitable continents. Now the Mongol Empire did an excellent job of incorporating conquered peoples into their military. They kept them loyal by first splitting them up into separate units so they know how, did not have their friends or family along with them, and they made desertion or um, betrayal punishable by death of the entire unit. So the entire unit would, would remain much more faithful and keep their um, members in line because if somebody, like I said, deserted or betrayed the army, uh, the entire unit would be killed for the actions of that one person. So they did a pretty good job of keeping them in line. The Mongols also posed a big threat to any empire uh, at the time that could not also field a large amount of cavalry horsemen. Now cavalry horsemen gave the Mongols a massive advantage because they could remain at range um, for many of the armies of Europe and China and Persia and other Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and they could also outrun any cavalry, or at least stay at a distance from them, and fire backwards and sideways and forwards uh, while riding their horses the entire time. So it became very difficult for any one army uh, to withstand this Mongolian onslaught, especially as the uh, forces of the Mongols just got larger and larger and larger as they conquered and incorporated more people. Now while these massive horse-based armies were not so good for sieging uh, cities and fortresses, uh, what the Mongols would do after they conquered China is they would take these Chinese siege workers who were adept and knowledgeable as to how to break down these thick walls and cities that the Persians and Middle Eastern peoples and Europeans had, and they would bring them along with them uh, to lay siege to these cities. Uh, so the Mongols were essentially unbeatable on land, at least at the time, and they could uh, effectively tear or wear down and siege down a city. which basically meant that nobody could stop them, uh, at least at that period of time. Even in the few battles where the Mongols were defeated, they usually returned very quickly after with a much larger force uh, and more experienced generals uh, to clear the field and carve clean up any mistakes that they had made. Now one of the problems that would plague the Mongol Empire throughout its existence are the disputes over who would take over after Chinggis. He had a son named Ogde, but he also had many, many other sons. In fact, he probably had the most kids out of anybody in the history of mankind. Uh, and as these sons grew and split apart and had grandchildren, etc., going forward and forward and further down the family tree, more and more conflicts over who was in charge uh, would arise and result in many civil wars and conflicts throughout the existence of the about 150 year uh, Mongol Empire. In fact, the Mongols were responsible for dismantling the Song Dynasty in China, uh, the Muslim states in Persia, and many of the Arab territories that have been conquered in Central Asia and the Middle East. They also brutalized and conquered many of the Russian peoples and Hungarians of Eastern Europe, uh, and they wrought havoc anywhere they went, stopping roughly in Egypt, Poland, Lithuania in um, Europe, and India in South Asia. To the east, they'd be stopped by a combination of bad weather and Japanese resistance, uh, with two invasions failing due largely in part to some untimely typhoons or tropical storm. Now, while the Mongol Empire was successful in conquering vast swaths of territory, they were not as successful in administering this territory. As these in-house family feuds began to break and uh, cause civil war within the Mongolian Empire, after 1294, with the death of Kublai Khan, which is sort of the last great Khan or leader of Mongolia that would maintain somewhat of a unified state, uh, the Mongol Empire would break up into four uh, different local areas or governments known as Khanates, starting with, in Europe, the Golden Horde, in Persia, the Ilkhanate, in Central Asia, the Chagatai Khanate, and in China, the Great Khanate. These Khanates were ruled by a Khan and established a sort of tribute system with the conquered peoples, much as the Mongol Empire had, uh, collecting taxes, slaves, and laborers uh, to continue their war effort. Uh, but they, they would also be known for fighting and infighting with each other, and they would not ultimately last all that long, uh, with the exception, of course, of the Chagatai Khanate in Central Asia, lasting about till about 1687. Now, while the Mongol Empire did not enforce any particular religion or culture or leave any architectural or linguistic traces, they would profoundly impact the trade and spread of ideas at the time by officially connecting with one centralized or at least stabilized empire, uh, the East and the West. 
where we are going to see a large amount or a large increase in the trade of good and exchange of ideas uh, going from the east to the west. The Mongols reestablished and consolidated the Silk Road uh, trade routes going from the east to the west, and they're also, with this increase in trade, is going to also increase the amount of trade going on in other uh, trade networks, such as in Indian Ocean and Mediterranean Sea. That's going to allow the ideas of uh, the Chinese with their inventions of the uh, compass, with paper money, of gunpowder, uh, and other innovations are going to be able to spread through India into Central Asia uh, and eventually into North Africa and Europe, where that's going to help spur um, a lot of innovation in the European Renaissance and following scientific revolution. Unfortunately, however, along with these ideas and goods also came disease. In fact, the connection of this Mongol trade route from China to Europe would bring with it, or cycle with it, uh, a long-standing uh, plague known as the bubonic plague that would circle through China and Europe, uh, particularly in Europe in the mid 14th century and wreak havoc on the populations, killing over a third of all Europeans and having mortality rates as high as 90% in cities that were much more dense and a lot less clean uh, and more accessible than the rural countryside areas. Along with the population decline, you also had a labor shortage, which actually turned out to be quite a good thing if you did survive, because that meant that with a an increase in demand for workers and not many being available, we would see a rise in wages and potentially any uh, children or women that wanted to join the workforce that were not able to before. You also have, particularly in Europe, a sort of obsession with death that you're going to see in art and poetry and literature as seeing and being a part of families and friend circles that have multiple people and members suffer and die right in front of your eyes uh, profoundly impacted the psyche of the especially Europeans at that time. Regardless, the spread of the Black Death and other diseases would really actually lead to the decline of many of the old powerful cities in the classical era, such as Rome, Alexandria, uh, Carthage, Pataliputra, Persepolis, and others. It would all also, though, on the flip side, cause a rise in power in many other city-states that saw an increase in trade and wealth and power, such as Venice in Italy, Novgorod in Northern Europe. You also have uh, cities like Malacca, Calicut, the Swahili city-states, uh, Timbuk Timbuktu. All of these are gonna be major city-states that become increasingly powerful uh, due to this increase in trade. And most of these cities were advantageously positioned along these trade routes. So they would collect a lot of trade and merchants, etc., cetera, uh, and, and increase the wealth of these and power of these states being a part of these enhanced um, trade networks. That concludes our discussion of the Mongol Empire and trade during the post-classical era. In our next video, we will be discussing the empires and civilizations of the Americas from the 13th to 14th and 15th centuries. And don't forget, if you want access to all of my videos on AP World Simplified with all topics or other tools and resources that AP students or teachers can use for AP World, feel free to check out my website at morganapteaching.com. Thanks for watching.